Hello and welcome to Season 2 of the Choose U Calgary's podcast, your one-stop shop for learning about U Calgary's admissions, programs, campus life, and everything else in between. My name is Max Sturley, and for this episode, I will be joined alongside Emma McDowell, who hosted the interview today. Emma is a student recruitment advisor who works primarily with students in BC and Saskatchewan, where I focus on the digital side of recruiting, also as an advisor. Emma had the chance to sit down with Dr. Catherine Lang, who is the, both the Associate Dean and an Associate Professor within the Faculty of Nursing. Dr. Lang in this conversation covered everything from different routes offered in nursing, studying abroad, in the faculty, and what she does in her role. Hope you enjoy the show. Let's just start by discussing what your role means. What is it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for having me today. Uh, so my role uh, as Associate Dean Undergraduate Programs is really everything operational. So I am responsible for making sure that there are people to teach all the courses that we offer, um, that they're trained well um, and appropriate to be where they are. And I'm responsible for budget um, with respect to... Um, undergraduate. Um, what else can I tell you? Gosh, there's, it's so big. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's so big. I, so I deal with student, any student issues that are related to theory courses. We have theory courses and clinical courses in our faculty. Okay. And so my counterpart, uh, Zara Shadiani, would deal with um, student issues in clinical practice, and I do anything curriculum related, um, so theory. So I sort of oversee all operations and then student issues with respect to that. Okay. Yeah, in a nutshell. Yeah. So, yeah. and when you say uh, curriculum, theory, and practicum, is the theory kind of more traditional, what you think of yep. in a lecture? Yes, it, it's all the lectures. Okay. It's all and the then, content. And then the practicum would be like placements yes, and stuff like exactly. that? Yes, exactly. Clinical okay. practice, yeah. Well, then yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> um, also, you are a professor as yes, well, right? I am. So, what courses do you teach? Where can students expect to see you? <laughs> yeah, so in, in this administrative role, I only have to teach one course a year versus the usual is four. Oh. So right now, the course that I'm, I uh, am responsible for is the oncology course, which is in the fourth year. We call it term seven, so the first semester of the fourth year. That's the one I teach. Oh, that's awesome. Other courses I've taught are in the graduate program around leadership, um, advanced practice nursing, and, but oncology is my, my jam. So, over the course of your career at the university, how long have you been here? Uh, coming up six years. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, you have undertaken and are currently working on a number of research fields mm -hmm. um, in pediatric oncology, like you said, your jam, yeah. and including uh, psychosocial care, yeah. digital storytelling, social return on investment. Can you tell us a little bit more? about those fields, why they're interesting to you, Sure. what made you decide yeah. to go into that? Very broadly, variable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I did my undergraduate degree at UC. And, um, in and your, what was it in? Oh, so, well, I have two. Oh. Um, first, one, first one was in kinesiology. Okay. Or back when I did it, which was a long time ago, it was called phys ed. Oh. And then, <laughs> and then in nursing. And so oh, okay. in the, um, the equivalent of the final practicum back then, I got into pediatric oncology. So as a senior student, I did my final practicum in peds oncology. And I, I essentially never left it. I got hired there, and then I, I just stayed in peds oncology my entire career um nursing well I'm still a nurse it's hard to it's the distinction is so funny I do I do <laughs> so hospital based let's say yes. hospital based nursing I was in peds oncology and I started as a student and I ended ended up as the manager so so I like to think that now that I'm in academics I still work with peds oncology just in a different way so now mm -hmm. it's research based and so when I was in pediatric oncology like as a as a frontline nurse you know every nurses are student nurses are always so concerned with skills mm -hmm. and getting the right skills and making sure they're up to date on their skills and whatnot and I always tell them like you have to trust me on this one but the skills are the boring part of the job <laughs> you, you learn after you heard it here first <laughs> I love that they are. because after a year you know the skills like yeah. you feel confident in your skills and then it's kind of like well now what so I, what really intrigued me when I was a frontline nurse was how these families got through having a child with cancer, which is such a broad question, right? But it's just, I kind of just remember 
being in awe of them thinking, how do they do this? How do they get through and how do they yeah. remain a family? And quite frankly, lots did not after yeah. the treatment. There's lots of divorces and whatnot. So anyways, the whole psychosocial care is, is so now that I can use a research lens looking at this, I am, that's really essentially what it boils down to is I'm interested in how families get through. Yeah. So I look at things like Cancer Camp, um, digital storytelling is another medium. Like I like to look at maybe things that you wouldn't consider traditional approaches to psychosocial care and how they, because when I was a, a, a staff nurse, I would he, families would tell me all the time, camp, 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 like they're so excited about camp. Their child c- would ask me about camp in January and it wasn't until the summer and, yeah. and I had never been. And I thought, what is it about this camp that is so great for these kids? And so that was the focus of my PhD research was oh, camp. And so anyways, all of that is, is um, my area of interest. And where the social return on investment comes in is I'm a little bit out of my lane in that department. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Um, but I, st- but, you know, so using the camp example, I got questions like, OK, so, w- you know, if camp is so great, what how do we how do we quantify that? Like, how do we understand what's the return on investment for camp? And, and it was like, well, that's a really hard question to answer because it's the, social, it's the social impact we're looking at. And then I learned about this thing called social return on investment and basically got a crash course in how to do it and, and very good tutelage and did a couple of studies around it um, in conjunction with, um, with a, a professional in that area to understand what's the social impact and the social value of camp. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's my... That's my angle on that one I guess that's so interesting and I would assume that the social return on investment is different yes for every individual family every individual child yeah yeah it I mean you come at the end of the day you come up with a ratio you know for every one dollar invested in camp I can't remember what we came up with I think it was something like seven dollars and fifty cents or something so but but it's not like it's not a it's not a you can't really compare it to the to return on investment in this because it's really more representative of something Mm -hmm. and and it's all the social impacts that come and how Mm -hmm. you quantify those and there's a a very long complicated process yeah Yeah. like there's no straight line no tons of yeah wiggly lines yeah (laughs) and you really come up with a ratio like a number and a story. So yeah. how you understand what that ratio means is, is the, where the story comes in. And it's oh, wow. as important as what the ratio is. So let's kind of dig into what it looks like for a prospective student mm-hmm. coming to the school, uh, whether the listener today is in grade 11, 12, thinking of transferring in, however we see it. Sure. As a whole, the faculty gives incoming students different options to choose from in terms of how to receive their admission. Can you describe those options available Mm. and under the nursing faculties and what the students would study? Yeah, sure. So we have three um, routes in, I would say. The first is what we call direct entry, which is for your high school students coming in generally right from high school or maybe taking a gap year and then coming. Uh, The second route is previous degree holders. Okay. So as, as the name implies, they've got a degree already. And but this, not this in would nursing, be obviously. Not in nursing, right. Okay. Somewhere in something different. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the third option is uh, our transfer route. So it would be university. They have some university courses. I believe it's less than 10. And so they come in as a transfer student. And so if they come in as a d- direct entry, so the high school route is another way to say it, then it's for four full years, traditional years, like you might think, fall, winter, times four years. And then um, the degree in transfer is a little bit different. It's it's two two to two and a half years. Mm-hmm. It's a condensed program, and they they basically skip the first year that that our high school students would take. Oh, okay. Yeah. So those so once once they so like I, I think I er, earlier said we call our, all of our semesters terms. Yeah. So once they hit term three, so so terms one and two are the first year, and so term three would be the start of year two. Yeah. Um, that's where their programs look the same so even though they they progress through the program uh, at different paces they study the same things until they hit the the last year okay so term seven the first semester of last year is their first opportunity to choose a specialization and so but up until that point um they're all they receive all the same education that way yeah and then so once they hit term seven they can choose between five specialty areas we have uh Pete's oncology, mental health and addictions, uh, 
what else? Let me think. Now I'm on the spot and I can't think of them. <laughs> pressure, <laughs> um, pressure. Old, older adults. Yeah. And... Oh, my God. I can't believe it. I'll come back to it. I forget okay. the fifth. Uh, Halfway through, so, just yeah. interrupt us. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll I'll be that. like, stop. I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that then their final year is is sort of specialized. Okay. So yeah, but up until then, it's the same. So I know that there are a lot of terms, uh, especially when I go visit schools. Uh, like I said, I'm a recruitment officer. So I'll say major, minor, yeah. combined degree, blah, 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 blah. Um, for example, my major was in communications and my minor was in business. What can nursing students expect in regards to a major, minor, combined degree, yeah. anything of the sort? Well, I, I have a disappointing answer for that, and we, <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> we don't offer combined degrees or major minors. Uh, and I don't know that that's unusual for a professional faculty like ours. And the reason is quite pragmatic. Um, there's just no space. There's no space in their schedules because they have to do so much clinical work off campus, often in hospitals, but not always. Yeah. And that there's really just no, no room in their schedules for it. And so I, th I know that in the past we've played around with a combined degree. I think we tried with kinesiology once and, and maybe other faculties that predate my time here. But um, yeah, and it just hasn't, it hasn't worked. So when students begin their University of Calgary deg degree, so they're all accepted, everyone's mm -hmm. got in. What can they expect in their first year in terms of classes, schedules, all yeah. sorts of stuff? So I'll answer it in terms of the, you know, the the person who's coming from high school, because like yeah. I said, all three cohorts are different. Yeah, we so, talk about it as if they're high school yeah, students. Yeah, so <laughs> first year, for so the first year, even though they're nursing students, it their first year is spent almost entirely away from our faculty doing all the required courses that are non-nursing specific. So for example, anatomy and physiology, um, that's a full year course they have to take. Philosophy, they have to do, uh, d there's not a certain philosophy, but they have to take a philosophy course, an English course, an academic writing course, that kind of thing. And so they get all those required courses and, and options out of the way that first year. And uh, again, this predates me, that decision um, to, to to have our program go like that. And I, and I believe the rationale for that was that, like I mentioned earlier, they have such busy schedules and they're off campus so much that fitting in courses, fitting in options and these other required courses around everything else was really problematic. And so the decision was made about 11 years, 10 years ago now, to, to structure our program like that so that they would sort of spend year one getting all those courses done and then, and then really in year two is when they become, you know, they feel like they're in nursing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, mm -hmm. Pragmatically, operationally, it, it works really well. But students, we have a real challenge trying to keep the students feeling like they're still part of nursing in that first year. So mm -hmm. so it's it, it's kind of, you know, patience is required and just getting through it. it the, an upside that students don't often see until later is that, you know, coming from high school, you're not just you're part of the challenge of university is learning how to be a university student mm -hmm. and figuring out the system and figuring everything out. So it, in a way, it's kind of nice that first year because it, even though the courses aren't easy, it eases them into our faculty. Well, and also since previously we mentioned there isn't an opportunity to do a dual, d like a double major, or a minor or anything, it'll give students the opportunity to kind of experiment mm -hmm. with some of those courses, like a sociology yeah. course, for example, or... Um, a philosophy course, which um, they they otherwise later on in their degree wouldn't be able to do. So, I think that's also a good way to look at it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Class sizes. What does it that look like for nursing students? What can they expect from yeah. first year to uh, their fourth year? Yeah, um, large to small. <laughs> large so to small. You start off with big classes, and I'm here, when I say classes, I'm talking about the. Tra the traditional kind of classes that we'd be thinking yeah. of. So, you what know. What we see in the movies. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and our large classes are, f I don't know, I, I'm about 110 to 135. So certainly larger exists, but that's, that's the size of our large classes. Um, and then 
so that's pretty typical for for a, um, a theory class. And then clinical, their lab, like when they're in the clinical groups, which is also their lab groups, mm -hmm. those are no more than eight students. Okay. So that's kind of nice. And then again, when they hit their senior year, their final year, their classes are much, much smaller. So they become about 21 to 24, maybe on the low side, and the high side would be about 35 to 40. Oh. So much smaller. So definitely yeah. not in the hundreds. No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, awesome. So we have a reputation for placing a focus on intensive research. Uh, what research opportunities are available for nursing students? And if you have any examples, mm -hmm. feel free I to do. share. We've got some <laughs> really, really great researchers in our faculty. Um, some with yourself included. Well, uh, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, but some with much bigger programs than I have. And um, so, so the quick answer is: there's lots of opportunities for undergraduate nurses. Um, it's it's mat the tricky part is matching a student's interest with someone who has something available at the time. Mm -hmm. And we have a research office that tries to do that online and then meets with them in person and whatnot. So, um, you know, it's it, we're not 100% successful at it, but we're, but we're often very successful at it. And so some examples. So, for example, our associate dean of research, Dr. Karen Benzies, uses, or I shouldn't say that like that, she has a lot, quite a few undergraduate students in her, that help her in her program of research, and they get to do things, so I'll just say really quickly, she's, she's interested, well, she's got lots of things on the go, but one of the things that she spends a lot of time doing is, it's called FICARE, which stands for Family Integrated Care, in um, particularly in neo neonatal ICUs. And so, you know, her students, her undergraduate students that work with her will take a little piece of what's happening at the time because it's such a massive project that spans years, um, a little piece of it and work on on whatever piece that she's assigned to them. And and from that, you know, they can do presentations and and publish, uh, get on um, publishing um, uh, on manuscripts with her and um, present at conferences and posters and that kind of thing. So it's really so so that's a one example. But, you know, times that by by however many researchers, you know. That and, are available. Yeah, yeah. And, wow. and like I said, it sort of depends on, on a person's size of the program that they have going on and, and how much the capacity they have. But we really, when students profess an interest in research, we really try to accommodate them. Yeah, you try yeah. and uh, yeah. breed that. Yes. Breed that idea. Yes, exactly. Love it. Um, so other than research, is there any unique or interesting opportunities um, that nursing students have access to. Yeah, yeah. And what would your favorite class be for them to take if you could pick for them? Okay, well, <laughs> unique opportunities, I'd say. I was thinking about that um, on my way over here, and I th this is going to sound maybe funny because maybe I'm not sure how unique it is. I think it's – anyways, <laughs> why don't we go on the premise that it's very unique. Um, so unique. We have, <laughs> we have two direct co-directors in our, in our faculty of Indigenous programming, okay. and they have different foci, each of them. But w w long story short, what has resulted having this, this increased focus on Indigenous programming is that we have – they have – developed um, really, really great relationships with – the different uh, indigenous communities we have around mm -hmm. us. And so because of that, we now have, so we've got clinical placements for sure yeah. that students can go out to, uh, you know, the various, the various indigenous communities around us and do their community placement there, for example, their community focused placement. And um, they, uh, the, the feedback from the students has been absolutely phenomenal. So I think that's, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think that's pretty unique um, for nursing schools because mm -hmm. I don't think many have co-directors. Um, and, and certainly the placements that we have are just amazing. And it's, it's really doing, oh. there's more work to be done, of course, but we've made some really nice inroads. Oh, and then you wanted my favorite course. Well, yes, what, what would you put them in if you could? Well, I mean, I think I have to say oncology. Of course. <laughs> but I mean, it, I would go to that, so you, you know what? Me. So, I, so... All kidding aside, it actually is a very well received course um, because students choose it for one. They don't mm -hmm. go; they're not in if they don't want to be. Mm -hmm. So they've chosen it. So you're already ahead of the game there, and it's in their senior year, so you can get kind of higher level. And it's 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 challenging, but it's fair. Like the feedback I get is it's a really fairly assessed course, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's just the the work they get to do is really neat in it. So I I am a huge fan. So what are the employment opportunities 
following graduation. Um, could do you know a little bit about life after U of C when you I graduate do. from the nursing program? Mm -hmm. Part of the work that I do is on a provincial level. So I was just um, recently in Edmonton um, getting sort of the lay of the land for Alberta in terms of employment opportunities and vacancies because nursing is so cyclical. I, when I graduated from nursing, um, there was no jobs. Like the, it was just sort of a fact there was no jobs. Uh, nurses were leaving for the states en masse and, and overseas, you oh, know, wow. so there was just no jobs. And then, and then the pendulum swung very, very far the other way, and then it was like nurses could have any job they wanted right out of school. Mm -hmm. And so now we're sort of back toward the first scenario I described, the pendulum being more on the... It, and it's funny, actually, I'm going to bookmark that for a second because it's funny because we have been hearing in nursing for ever, it feels, that there is a massive nursing shortage coming because the baby boomers are going to be retiring. Mm -hmm. So, but we have yet to really see that, or at least I thought so, because in Calgary we're hearing, no, you know, you have to, they have to start as getting casual jobs right now, casual positions, I should say, which is like you fill in for sick calls, right, and, mm -hmm. and vacations and whatnot, um, which is how I started. And, and then you eventually sort of work your, your way up and you get a, we call them lines. You get a line. You own a position, basically, is mm -hmm. what that means. Um, so so the, at the last provincial meeting I was at, um, you know, we all sort of, all of us urban center people said, yeah, this is sort of the scenario. And all of the rural placement people were saying, are you kidding me? We have 20 jobs posted right now that we cannot fill. So there is... Lots of opportunities, but my best um, advice for nurses would be, if you can, be flexible in where you go. Rural nursing, although, you know, everyone wants, it's sexy to stay urban, right? It's sexy to stay in the big centers mm -hmm. and, and whatnot, and, and not as many people want to go, go rural, but you get so many amazing opportunities in a rural center that you would not get in an urban center just because of lack of people and, and, and yeah. more opportunities and l less access to, you know, all the amenities that we have here. Well, and just because you start rurally doesn't mean you live there forever. Like, nothing's exactly. permanent. You exactly. take that experience, you learn that unique opportunity that you wouldn't have been able to develop exactly in downtown Calgary, for an example. And then when you want to come back to downtown Calgary, you have something that someone else wouldn't have right. just worked in Calgary. Yeah, exactly. Well yeah. put. Mm -hmm. So, co-op internship. Do yeah. we have those available for nursing students? Um, what are their options? Yeah, not not per se. Um, however, because uh, internships, you're, I believe you're usually paid a small stipend. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's the same for co-ops or not. So we don't... I think it is, but yeah. I don't know. We, d <laughs> we don't call it that, but it's sort of... Um, you know, you could argue that the last, their final focus, the last semester of their last year, is essentially that. Because they are paired with one-to-one -one with a preceptor in, you know, could be the community, could be hospital, wherever setting they've chosen. And they work, um, you know, between three and 400 hours with that person. They don't do any classes other than a weekly two-hour seminar. So it's all, it's all practice-based. And so in a way, it's kind of like that, but they're just not getting paid. I always tell them, you're going to feel like free labor by the end of your, <laughs> by the end of your, um, your last term, and that's what you should be feeling like because you, it means you're ready. It means you're ready to go yeah. and be independent. So do nursing students have the opportunity to take advantage of studying abroad? And what would that look like if that is an opportunity. Yeah, so if we had been talking a year ago, I would have said yes. Um, we have, so we have a sister campus mm -hmm. uh, in Doha, Qatar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called University of Calgary, Qatar. And um, we, up until this year, we had opportunity to send uh, around 12 students a semester in their final focus in term eight um, to Doha. And um, that, that program has since been put on hold this year because we're really reevaluating our international strategy, I guess you might call it, in terms of we, we, we love the Doha opportunity, but we want to do more. And we want to have more, I think, I, I guess I'd call it like a, a, a strategic approach to our international experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at, we're revising our curriculum um, right now. On, well, it, we're undergoing the process of it. And part of what we want to look at is, is making a much more specific, you know, global health course, which would include an international placement. 
or I shouldn't say international, because what we're talking about, there's such a need in rural areas of mm -hmm. Canada. So, you know, if you call it a global course, rural you can be encompassed in that too, right? So mm -hmm. you can get an, you can get a global experience in your own backyard. Yeah. And and have those kinds of things. So so that's what we're really you know, like I said, that program's on hold right now as we are revising our curriculum. Yeah. But um so the good news is is, you know, when when it goes live it will, will have really a really nice um um tailored approach for that, yeah. I think. Yeah. And therefore would also I would assume lead to more opportunities so instead of just yeah. going to Qatar right could go to yeah w northern well, BC or yeah, whatever yeah we have some good relationships with Aga Khan University in Pakistan oh, wow. um, our dean Sandra Davidson comes well not directly comes from but she has worked over in um, uh, Arizona State University so she's looking at partnerships with them so you know there's lots of there's lots of feelers out in terms of where we might be looking and, and it's not to say that there's no opportunities right now. Like, for example, we have two nursing students right now that are over in Uganda. Yep. And th they're, but it's through the international office, the, the oh, what's it called? The QE2 scholarship. I can't remember exactly. The Queen's Jubilee or something like that. So it's not, it's not like we made that happen for them, but there are, there are if opportunities. If you're looking for yes. it, you can find it exactly. and you can do it. Yes. So, yes. okay. That's, well, I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. Uganda, that's cool. Yeah. When it comes to admissions, obviously, we're looking at grades. Mm -hmm. Is there any other thing that students can do to improve their chances of getting in or guaranteeing themselves admission? Oh, I wish I had a better answer um, than this. And, and the answer is no. They're really, it's entirely grade focused. And nobody thinks that's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, this is a problem that nursing schools in North America face there's no exception to it and it's it's literally a supply and demand thing we get you know 10 to 15 applicants for every seat that we have and there's just not the manpower to to admit any other way so we have a ridiculously high average that's needed um to get into nursing so i would not have made it let me tell you coming from high school i would not have been admitted based on the average that we have yeah. um it's about 88.5 yeah. minimum from high school and, um, you know, and I always tell students that are talking about it saying, you know, I, I couldn't get in. I, I wouldn't be able to get in. What should I do? I really want to be a nurse. So there's, I, there's a couple of options that way because I realize it's, it's, a, it's just a, it's a prohibitively high average for some people. It's a hoop. It's yeah, a big hoop it's a big hoop. You've got to jump through yeah. it for sure. So obviously upgrading. Mm -hmm. is, is a tactic you can use. There's no rule that says you have to come to school straight from high school, right? No. You can definitely that take... That is <laughs> no. societal pressure. Exactly, exactly. So don't... So get rid of that if that's the pressure that's that you're feeling. That's what I tell students all the time. Yeah. I'm like, no. Well, and you know <laughs> you're what? You're going to be so young when you graduate anyways. Oh, exactly. So. But you're, you feel the pressure, and I remember feeling it too. Um, but it's just, you know, now that I'm a lot older, <laughs> I look back and think, oh, God, what was I so worried about? Exactly. So young. And then another another thing that, again, it's not like this is an option for everybody, but, you know, we have a, we have, um, well, we have the sister campus in, in Qatar, mm -hmm. but we also have a satellite campus here in Alberta in Medicine Hat. And lots of big universities have satellite campuses. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, U of A works with, um, I think they've got maybe three Oh, wow. satellite campuses and sometimes it's not to say that it's easy to get in there but it, sometimes because there's not as much demand their aver their admission averages can be lower and so if it's an option to look at so some of these smaller sites that's that's one route to go because I mean again at that provincial meeting I was just at U of A their admission average is 91 mm -hmm. to get in and it's you know it's be, and just because you've got that high of average, that doesn't mean you're going to make a, the best nurse. Yeah. Grades are not the best predictor of the best nurses. Mm -hmm. exactly. So, so I would say, you know, if people are really like nursing is for me and you don't have that average, start looking at okay. Medicine Hat Campus yeah. and McEwen College and, you know, like the different areas, different ways or to take, get in. Yeah. Take a year off, upgrade, upgrade. and while you're upgrading, yeah. volunteer at a hospital or yeah. volunteer in a in yeah. your community yeah. to, in any way that you can without needing your legal license <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly yeah so there's tons of opportunities for sure what is the best way for a student to learn more about the faculty of nursing we have a pretty impressive website if i do say so myself <laughs> not that i had anything to do with it <laughs> but it's really it's just been revamped i thought it was good before and now it's amazing so you know basically any question you would 
possibly one answer to this stage. Could, could You could find it on our website. So that would be step one. We also have two really fantastic student advisors who um, you don't need to make an appointment with. You can drop in. Um, you know, you can find them on the website and email them or drop in and talk to them personally during their advising hours. So they're, they're the ones that know, they're the people that I go to and say, um, can I do this? <laughs> or what should I say? You know, they know all the ins and outs and, and what have yous of the program and are really, really savvy at guiding students well. Mm-hmm. Prospective and current students, I'd say. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So those are probably the best ways to find out more. So we've reached our final question. Okay. So... <laughs> If you had one piece of advice to give a prospective student that is considering the University of Calgary, what would it be? Well, I'm going to take the grades thing out, right? Because we've already talked about yes. getting good grades. So get good grades. That's we already fun. told you how to do all that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to answer this almost saying, almost pretending that the student has, has received an offer of admission and is debating whether or not to accept it. Okay. Let's, let's do that. Um, so my advice would be take it, <laughs> take that <laughs> offer of admission. It's impressive that you got offered, um, and it's a it's a great program. It's not without it's not without flaws like any other program, and we can certainly um, and will you know amend things in our new curriculum. But it's the greatest profession I, in the world, I think, and I know I'm extremely biased, <laughs> but um, it is it is such a privilege and an honor to be invited into the most intimate moments of people's lives you know from 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 birth to death you see it all as a nurse and so you have to go through uncomfortable moments in in your faculty like anybody any faculty would offer there's hard courses there's easier courses there's courses they want to not do and think they're a waste of time but but you know they have to do them anyway and there's lots and lots of complaints and and whatnot but you you get through it at the end of the day and then you are in the greatest profession I think. And so we have, we are such an amazing university here. We are, we have leadership that's second to none and um, are in just such a great position um, with, you know, with respect to a lot of other universities in our category, you know, the young universities. And um, you just, you can't beat the UC. How's that for cheerleading holy smokes i know want to come on the road with me you just <laughs> you just sold me and i already went here <laughs> yeah exactly i should go oh, yeah, yeah exactly uh yeah you're gonna come with me on the road this fall thank <laughs> you <laughs> so that was all the questions i mm-hmm. so appreciate you coming in and sharing all your expertise with us it you taught me more than mm. i knew which is mm. again so beneficial not only for me but for the students i will be interacting mm, with of soon. course thank you for having so, me i really appreciate you coming in and hopefully we'll get you on next time to talk yeah. about all your research all sure anytime perfect thanks thank emma you. thank you so much for tuning in and be sure to keep an eye out for any upcoming episodes If there's an area that you would like to see covered on this podcast, drop a line to me. My email is in the description below. Additionally, if you'd like to connect directly with the Faculty of Nursing and their undergrad programs office, you can do so via phone or email. Their phone number is 403-220-4636 and their email is nursing at ucalgary.ca. I'll also leave those in the description for you. Today's music was performed and arranged by Alvin Fenner, also known as Neat Beats. My name is Max Sterley, and we'll see you next time 